Hello, everyone. My name is Suha Asoyla, and I'm the Director of Operations at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems. We at Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems welcome you and thank you for attending our first installment in the two-part series of educational webinars entitled The Basics of Isolation Technology. Let me point out, if you have a question during this presentation, you may submit your question online at any time. Please refer to the Q&A pane on the right side of your screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, we will try to accommodate all of the questions during our question and answer forum. Okay. Hosokawa Micron Power Systems is a division of Hosokawa Micron Group with headquarters in Osaka, Japan. We are the global leader in powder processing equipment with over 1,500 employees worldwide, production facilities in five countries, and 12 research facilities and state-of-the-art test centers. Hosokawa Micron Powder Systems, founded in 1923 under the name of Pulverizing Machinery, is responsible for the North American market. We, from Summit, New Jersey office, provide sales, engineering, manufacturing, and aftermarket services for the food, pharmaceutical, chemical, and minerals industries. We are proud to be the inventors of the micropulverizer hammer and screen mill, as well as the most versatile air classifying mill, DACM. Our brand names include Micro, Alpine, Riconada, Majac, Micron, Stott, and Wilaire. So, what is containment? In the context of our discussion, containment is the separation of product from the operator or the environment. The reason for containment could vary, but primarily it is to protect the operator in case of toxic or highly potent compound. Alternatively, the goal could be to protect the product when dealing with sterile products. Finally, there could be a requirement to accomplish both when working with sterile products that are also highly potent. During this presentation, we will concentrate on containment as it relates to protecting the operator. This could range from general housekeeping in order to isolate the operator from excessive dust to minuscule amounts of product when handling highly prone substances. Just to give you an idea, a one grain of salt would be in the range of 50 micrograms. Hence, an OEL, OEL of 50 micrograms per cubic meter over an eight hour time weighted average would mean that an operator cannot be exposed to no more than a grain of salt during their eight-hour shift. The best possible place to start our discussion would be to talk about some of the common terminology. We will start with OEL, which stands for Occupational Exposure Level. Please do not confuse this with Operator Exposure Level, or else you will get your industrial hygienist very upset. Occupational exposure level is usually measured in micrograms per cubic meter and is calculated as an average over an eight-hour time period, typical work shift. There are some additional terms that are also utilized, like PEL, permissible exposure limit, MAC, maximum admissible concentration, TLV, threshold limit, LTEL, long-term exposure limit, STEL, and MEL for maximum exposure limit. But as I indicated earlier, the most significant is the OEL, and to a lesser degree, the MEL, which is the maximum exposure limit. Here, just to give you an idea of what OEL really stands for, we can take a look, quick look at this example that I have on the slide, where if you're in an environment that has contaminants in your work area of 60 micrograms per cubic meter, and your operator is going to be working in that environment for a total duration of six hours, you know, you can calculate the eight-hour time average OEL by taking that 60 micrograms, multiplying it with the six hours working time, and then dividing it by the eight-hour period, which gives you the 45 micrograms uh, per cubic meter. Another term that's widely used is OEB, which stands for Occupational Exposure Bands. The occupational exposure bands are broken out into five groups where each band signifies a range of occupational exposure levels, OELs. 
This can allow for establishing more standard solutions to containment when employees are engaged in similar tasks or processes. As can be seen in this slide, the ranges in each band is relatively large, and as such, uh, I don't think it's really appropriate to assign one set of solutions for each band. Rather than trying to come up with a containment strictly off an OEB, it might be more advantageous to review the process, i.e., the duration of process, number of cycles of a given process in a given time interval, and finally, the OEL of product, as well as the product exposure potential, which directly relates to how fine and dusty the product is, in order to determine what the best containment solution is possible. You will see in the next few slides that we have also introduced an OEB6, a sixth category, to isolate the OEL levels below 10 nanograms, which will allow for a better definition of solutions in this low containment range. Here, uh, in these next few slides, I will talk about a simple method that can be used to determine the containment strategy associated with a given set of operational conditions. Um, you can see the color wheel where we have um, some donuts in, inside of one another with the outer blue one, the quantity handled. Uh, the green in, in, inside of that is the task duration, uh, one further in yellow being the dust potential. And finally, the, the, the innermost, the, the red uh, circle being the exposure potential. Now, if we were to look at a scenario where you were dealing with, let's say, a 50 kilograms of a batch size of material with 50 kilograms, that you needed to process over 20 minutes, and based on the particle size, you know, very fine particles and the density of your material, let's say your dust potential falls into medium. Then, by looking at this chart, we can 50 kilograms would fall into the medium area where you could see the kilograms here, and then 20 minutes would qualify as a short duration, so we would be in this half of it, and then the dust potential being medium, which is here, will lead us to an expo exposure potential of two, which is an E2. What we will then do is um, try to incorporate the um, operate, occupational exposure bands with this data to come up with a strategy. And here, one additional piece of information we're going to need is the OEL level of the product, or the OED. In this case, for this product, let's say it's defined as 150 micrograms per cubic meter, and that would fall into an OED2, which actually is a range of 100 to 1,000 micrograms per cubic meter. So. If we start with OEB2, which is right here on our, on our um, strategy wheel, and then from the previous slide we've determined the exposure potential of E2, that leads us to the uh, containment strategy of S2. Now, what does S2 mean? And this chart basically uh, itemizes different containment strategies depending upon what class of uh, strategy you fall into. In our case, we ended up with S2, which meant a local exhaust ventilation or a laminar flow booth. And again, there's general ventilation, downflow booths, closed handling of isolators, and robotic handling. So different levels requiring different uh, strategies. At this point, we can start to talk about some of the containment options we will allow, uh, which will allow us to associate them with OELs as we move forward. The most basic system would be packing heads. They come in a variety of designs from outward inflatable heads to downward or inward inflatable options. These systems can be used to minimize general dusting in charging, discharging operations, where they can be used to seal against a solid surface like a discharge tube or against a drum ledge in case of downward sealing heads. The most common application would be the outward sealing head, which is used in most part to seal plastic bags that are being filled. And here, just to point out, this is a downward inflatable head that could seal against the rim of a drum. Um, here you can see an inward sealing head where the inflatable section is going inward, so if you drop a tube inside of here, it will seal against that. And this is the outward sealing head, which we'll talk in more depth about. And the last one here is a pneumatic mechanism that moves the gasketed surface up and down, 
with a flexible connection so that you can feel against a, again a flat surface. Here we're seeing a short video uh, that shows the operation of an outward inflatable uh, head with the use of compressed air behind the bladder. Uh, there is an internal passage to the side exhaust connection, which can be tied into a nuisance system and facilitate in removing the displaced gas for the container or the bag that's being filled. Um, you can see that there's an exhaust port here that I talked about. And um, there's an exhaust port here that you can see where the gas that gets pulled out from the displaced gas and can be exhausted out to a nuisance system. And additionally, there could be an additional connection which could bring in uh, purge gas to equate the balance below and above the, the packing heads. On the left side of the slide, we can see an inflatable head being utilized as part of a fillway system. This setup, as shown, is typically used with a line drums where the operator will pull the liner up and around the ceiling head. Uh, let me just point that out. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, around the, the ceiling head, at which point the bladder will be inflated to create the seal, allowing for dust-free filling. And here you can see the operator pulling actually the, the bag around the, the ceiling head, which then he will activate the bladder to inflate and seal against that plastic bag. The image on this slide shows a variation of the same concept as the earlier slide, where rather than using individual bags, a continuous liner has been incorporated, allowing for much better containment. It is worth talking a little bit more on continuous liners, since they can provide a high degree of containment in a simple and economical fashion. The basic concept here is a polyethylene tube, which is placed, and you can barely make it out here, but you know, the polyethylene tubing is, is um, attached onto a cartridge that's pulled over a ceiling head. And once you draw down the polyethylene bag or the, the tube and crimp the bottom of it, you're essentially turning that into a bag. You can stretch this down, as seen on section three, and inflate the head to, to seal that section from, the, from above, at which point you can start your filling process, and once the bag gets to the desired level, you can do a crimp and cut, as can be seen on the fourth uh, image, and this way sealing the bag up and sealing the above process as well in the, in the process. Um, this slide uh, takes a closer look at the double crimp and cut te uh, technique utilized with most continuous liners. People have opted to use two separate tie wraps after duct taping a section of a bag, but these will not produce the proper level of containment the technology is capable of. We will get in more depth into discussions with this technology in the second part of these webinar series. But in general, th there are special crimp tools available um, to point out, special crimp tools available with a slit in between where there is a, um, a special tool, again, as shown here, that's used to squeeze it and tie, form a very, very tight connection, and then a separate cutter that will allow you to cut in between those two uh, slits, allowing for two sealed off sections, e each one of them coming with a cap so that you can cap them off as you can see in this last, last picture, that would peel off that area and maintain high levels of containment. Um, in this slide, we can see the incorporation of the pinch valve with an inflatable head showing the workings of a full weight system. And you can see the pinch valve up here uh, closing and opening based on um, the, the um, requirements. But what I'm trying to do is rerun this one more time so that we can go over it quickly. The, the bladder is inflated, so it's sealed. 
the, the pinch valve is released, so material is filling in, bulk filling. When the weight gets to a certain limit, the pinch valve closes, and, and we will release and vibrate it so that we do the trickle filling. And once the operation is concluded, the pinch valve will close and the inflatable head will deflate, allowing for the bag to be removed. The next step, as we try to improve containment levels, would be the addition of extraction, meaning airflow. This could be done with either simple local extraction or laminar flow boost that encompass the process. These devices, for the sake of simplicity and economy, do not have any local filtration, nor do they have the suction source. They rely on existing plant nuisance systems for filtration and flow. Laminar flow boosts are typically designed to fit around the process with no room for the operator. They work offline, or I'm sorry, they work off the principle of providing a steady stream of airflow across the dust zone away from the front where the operator would be located. The reason for laminar flow is to prevent or minimize turbulence. Setting up a 90 feet per minute velocity provides the airstream the ability to carry the dust particles while not creating a turbulent flow, which would cause the dust particles to move in an unpredictable way, causing containment issues. Laminar flow boosts can be designed in numerous forms. On the left, you can see a fill weight system that has been placed inside of laminar flow booth, where the perforations in the back wall will allow for the airflow to leave the, the chamber in a uniform fashion. We can add even perforated doors with glow ports um, on the front side of these units to increase the containment levels. And on the right, you can see a cupboard style laminar flow booth that can be utilized in laboratories when dealing with small amounts of material. Even big bag filling stations or IBCs can be placed inside of laminar flow booths. In the photo shown, you can see a dual station filling system with a downward sealing head. Here you can see the downward sealing head with the expanded um, expansion joint there. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice that uh, this is a pneumatic head with a solid sealing surface that is lowered onto the inlet port of the container, which can be seen on the, on the right side. Here, the primary containment is provided by the downward ceiling head, and the laminar flow booth serves as a secondary protection for added safety and improved OEL levels. As mentioned earlier, the biggest advantage of laminar flow booths is the fact that they have a very simple design and hence are economical solutions compared to some of the alternatives. The fact that the airflow is once through will allow for them to be used with solvents and fumes. There are some disadvantages like every, every other technology. Due to the set velocity requirement, if the units are large, it will require high volumes of airflow, which, which could become a problem to an existing nuisance system. Additionally, the air flowing over a process area is coming from the surrounding environment, which could contaminate the product depending upon the air quality in that environment. If we were to take the laminar flow concept one step further, which is forming an actual working environment where the operator as well as the process is in a laminar flow environment, we would end up with a downflow booth. As the name indicates, the laminar flow is in a downward direction where 85% of the total flow is recirculated to allow for 15% bleed in from the lower part of the booth. Um, and you can kind of see that here where about 10 to 15 percent comes from below, 85 percent coming from above, and circulating up around. And then that 10 percent that makeup is coming below is exhausted out into the environment from the top of the unit. And the reason for this is to make sure that, you know, we don't have any particles as they're being carried downward, that they're also carried to the side where the site filtration is. These units typically come with three stages of filtration, and the first stage is typically a disposable coarse T4 panel filter, which can filter out 5 microns coarse of particles, as located
located right here on the back panel. The filter uh, that follows this is typically an F8, which is rated for one micron filter. And then after the blower, there'll be typically a HEPA stage, which is an H13, H14, to make sure that the recirculating air is contaminant free. Due to the recirculating air going through the fan, which is also in this plenum, during extended operations, temperature rises to be expected. Additionally, cooling coils can be provided in the plenum to maintain a comfortable working temperature environment. And if we do, we will add the cooling coil in the zone here of the plenum just before the return line. In this video here, you can see the airflow patterns in that downflow booth. And you can see, again, a 90 feet per minute velocity downwards and slightly higher velocity on the very lower section carrying the material to the panel filters on the side. Here you can see the plenum area of a recirculation style downflow booth looking from the outside where the filters and fans are located. The top fins with the red arrow indicates where the flow is being redirected to the top distribution plate. Again, here the flow comes up in this direction and goes into the top distribution plate for, for the downward motion. Although the majority of downflow booths provided will be recirculation style, in cases of solvents or toxic fumes are part of the process, there are once-through designs available. These units are very similar in design, yet slightly taller, and are a little more expensive due to the additional fan on the inlet side. Here you can see the additional fan on the inlet side. Just as the recirculation style, 90% of the total flow is blown in from the top, while the remaining 10% comes from the lower front section of the booth. Again, here is the 10% coming in, and the 90% coming in from the top. Um, allowing for dust particles to get conveyed to the panel filters and out of the process zone. Here we can see Here we can see um, what the single pass uh, booth looks like from the back side as well, where you can see the stacks coming off the blowers that needs to be let out to a safe area, as well as the extra inlet fan that's on the top area that's pointed out with the, the red fan arrow, which adds to the overall stack. Uh, these booths were uh, whether they are recirculating or single pass are custom designed for project requirements. Anything that is needed can be designed into them, but extra attention must be paid to the cleaning procedures since any crevice or ledges that is formed in the booth is going to add to the cleaning time as compared to a clean straight wall design. And here you can see that you know we can build in shelves, we can build in uh, internal shelves, uh, drawers, um, so Anything is really possible, but again, cleaning is going to be uh, have to be thought of because if, when you're dusting in this area, um, there's potential for cleaning extension of cleaning times. As with any other containment technology, proper operating procedures need to be followed in order to get the full benefits these units have to offer. The key issue will be to keep the process 
or the dust source in the identified working zone and never to stand between the dust source and the back filters. Additionally, since the laminar airflow is downward from the ceiling, if the dust source were to be kept below the respiratory zone of the operators, the chances of any dust particles rising up will be minimized. And you know what, I will show you in the next upcoming slides, but all the downflow booths on the internal wall, side walls, you will see a red line indicating the working zone inside of them where the process needs to be kept in. Since the laminar air movement is a key to the performance of a downflow booth, the operators, operators need to be very careful in their movement, limiting how fast they move not to disturb the environment. Now again, this is not just walking, but even the hand movements and arm movements are very critical so that a no turbulence is created, which could again cause particles to rise up to the uh, breathing zone of operators. Besides from the air movement that provides the primary protection, mechanical separation between the dust source and the operator could improve the achieved containment significantly. Mechanical protection can come in the form of a solid plexiglass shield to flexible curtains to pivoted panels with glow ports that can move in five axes to provide ultimate mobility while keeping the product away from the operator. Although the working zone or downflow booths are identified with a red line along the side wall, since the front of the booth is open to the environment, it is critical to make sure that there is no significant air disturbance in the area, which could lead to turbulence in the booth, causing for unnecessary risk to the operators. Again, if you're locating your downflow booth to close to an outward outside bay door, or if you have heavy, very heavy traffic, uh, forklift traffic in front of it, these are things that are potential sources that could cause problems for disturbing the air patterns inside of a downflow booth. In the case where this, this can present a problem, adding panels or doors where possible would eliminate this potential risk. It must be noted, though, that these doors will add access restrictions which are not very desirable either. So the designs are made based on each customer's specific requirements and environmental conditions. Here you can see that the areas are closed off and there's um, filter panels provided on the bottom for that lower end air movement to move the material off the floor. But again, if you were trying to bring material in with forklifts and whatnot, these are gonna provide, uh, the panels are gonna provide a major restriction to your operation. Similar to operator movement, creating a disturbance in the air pattern, a piece of equipment that generates airflow could have a similar effect. Hence, precautions need to be taken to achieve the desired containment. This could be anything from redirecting the flow through ducting to a space outside of the booth to adjusting the flow to the direction in an area where it will not cause any concerns. Any high-speed equipment or equipment that requires compressed gas could fall into this category, and special considerations might have to be given uh, to them. To review the benefits of downflow booths, they provide self-contained work zones that could sustain OEL levels below five micrograms per cubic meter with proper operating procedures and supplemental measures like continuous liners and safety screens. In general, this technology is not meant for open handling of any potent compounds since the inland and outlet from these workspaces are not restricted, hence leading to a possible contamination of the surroundings. They do cost more than laminar flow booths that we reviewed earlier, and the onboard static filtration systems do have a limited dust capacity. There are instances where reverse pulse filtration can be incorporated in the plenum area, but this would have to be evaluated based on material properties as well as the final dust loading required. This slide can serve as a summary to our discussion so far. On the left side, you're seeing the occupational exposure bands, and on the right side, potential solutions that can be associated with them. And this could work as a, a quick reference chart to give you an understanding of what type of a, a containment uh, solution you're gonna need. Now, you can see in this chart that downflow booth is, is called out in several places, 
So it could be in an OEB2 environment, OEB3 environment, OEB4 environment. So this is just, like I said, a cheat sheet basically to give you a very crude and general idea. This concludes our presentation today on basics of isolation technology. I hope you found the information today informative, and I thank you for your participation. Please check our website for the second part of this webinar, where we will cover high containment and specifically talk about continuous liners for applications down to one microgram per cubic meter, Hycoflex bag technology, split butterfly valves and RTPs. Um, it tied in with key points in designing flexible and rigid wall isolators. At this point, we can start our Q&A session where we'll try to answer your questions. All right, thank you, Suha. Um, the first question we have here is, uh, you mentioned that a larger laminar flow booth would require high air volumes. Can you please explain this? Um, basically, uh, the, the laminar flow booth has, uh, as I, we showed in earlier slides, a back plate which has perforations on it. Um, and, and as we try to maintain a 90 feet per minute velocity across that whole back plate, uh, if that square footage gets bigger, in essence, the CSM or cubic feet per minute of airflow that's required is going to get much larger. So that's what the tie-in is. It's the square footage of that area multiplied by 90 feet per minute, which gives you your uh, CSM. So uh, that's the direct correlation. Okay. Okay, next question. What is the temperature rise expected in a downflow booth if there is no cooling? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, due to the um, blowers inside of recirculation style downflow booths, you are going to see a potentially a couple of degrees of temperature rise during a, a typical shift. Now, this could obviously be, um, you know, there's a couple of different things that would affect this. Um, one of them being the horsepower of the booth, meaning how much airflow, the you know, size of the, the downflow booth and the horsepower on the, the fan is going to change the amount of um, heat that's being put in, as well as the uh, makeup air that's coming from the surrounding environment, if that's like a controlled environment where you're maintaining um, a 65, 70 degree con air conditions, uh, that will also allow the, some, some cooling effect. But, you know, in cases where, you know, this, this downflow booth is going to run for extended periods of time, uh, like I mentioned, we do provide uh, cooling coils in the uh, plenum upper plenum area to maintain comfortable working temperatures. Okay, next question. Why do you need an inlet fan on a once-through downflow booth? Um, that's, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, in general, if, if you, uh, maybe I can go back to that slide very quickly, and hopefully it doesn't go into any of the videos. In, in this slide, you can see that if we did not have this upper fan and relied only on this uh, back, back fan to suck in the air, there would be no way for us to control where that air is coming from. Since the front of the booth is open, and if you have only suction coming through this bottom filter area, it could suck all the air through the room. So in essence, what this top fan is doing is it's blowing that air from the top down, giving you the nice laminar distributed flow, and the second fan is sucking it out to provide the additional suction source that's needed from the room for this bottom movement and, and blowing it off the stack. Okay, just going to go through. Uh, next question. What type of access is required and from where for servicing downflow booths? Um, this could be, um, well, the answer to this question is it could be from either either side. This could be from the inner side of the downflow booth as well as from the outside. For the most part, the preference is obviously to, to access it from the inner side. There are panels on the walls that are being, you know, you're capable of removing. Uh, filters can be removed from the inside of the booth. But, you know, we have done situations where the filters can be removed from the outside, and if there's containment issues associated with it, we can provide bag-in, bag-out designs on those uh, filters so that as they're being removed, they're still in a contained, uh, uh, they're removed in a contained manner. Okay. All right, 
next question, what type of containment levels can we expect with packing heads? Well, this is a, the answer to this question is kind of long-winded, but, uh, you know, in generic terms, just a basic packing head is going to give you a containment level of about 1,000 uh, micrograms or 1 milligram per cubic meter. Now, uh, combining this technology with other technologies like extraction systems, continuous liners, downflow boosts, are going to improve this technology all the way down to one microgram. So, again, it, it's partially the number of cycles that, that the, um, the, 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 I'm sorry, the um, packing head is going to be used, um, and the characteristics of the material are going to all play into this, but it is an extremely wide range. Okay, next question. Where can I find out the OE le OEL levels of given products? Well, typically, um, you know, the OEL levels are provided by, um, you know, each company's um, uh, safety group uh, based on the product characteristics. Um, there are some established values, but in, in the most part, we rely on the customers giving us the OEL levels based on their experience and testing that they've done on products. Okay. Uh, next question, uh, someone wants to know, is there an OSHA regulation related to operator exposure? Um, actually, there is. And you know what, maybe um, with the previous question, this, this also might relate to that. Um, OSHA has a regulation, CFR uh, 29, part 1910, uh, I believe it's subpart uh, Z, uh, which has quite extensive information, and there's a list of OELs listed for certain particles and exposure levels associated with them for operator protection. Okay. Next question. Uh, I've heard the term PPM being used for containment. Is there a way to correlate that to micrograms per cubic meter? Um, yes, there is. In essence, uh, PPM, which is parts per million, is in, in basically it's milligrams per kilogram. So if you know the density of the product, you can multiply that with the PPM value, and that will give us milligrams per cubic meter, which can then be multiplied by another thousand to give us micrograms per cubic meter. Now, if this was, I guess, solvents, the story is a little bit different than temperature, pressure, issues come into play, and the conversion is a little bit more complicated, but still, there is a direct way of converting. Okay. Next question. Are there any restrictions on the size of a downflow booth? Um, you know, in general terms, um, there is not much of a restriction on the size of a downflow booth, but if the height of the downflow booth goes above a certain uh, height, to maintain or not to disturb uh, the downward laminar flow, we do provide um, laminated curtains on the front side, you know, protecting a certain upper portion of the uh, front entrance area of a downflow booth. Um, but with that, you know, they can be built fairly tall. As, as far as the other dimensions, you know, you also have um, this, this working zone that I talked about earlier with the red line, and maybe – we can, let me see if I can go back and, and see. Um, and you can, you can clearly see the red line here. And then if we go back a couple more slides, I think it's more clearly defined. You can see it right here. And, and this is, try, you know, we try to keep this around six feet. Um, and, the, and the goal is to make sure that on, on, on a scenario where the fan is pushing the flow up, you don't want this flow coming too far up to the front because what's going to happen is if you extend this depth too far out, the farthest out portions might not get the best flow distribution. So we try to limit the, the working depth to around six feet. So, well, thank you very much, Zuha. This concludes the question and answer session of uh, today's presentation. Um, if you had a question that you submitted online and it was not answered, please note we will respond to you offline uh, very shortly. If you have any other questions in the meantime, please feel free to contact Suha using his contact information provided above. We thank you very much.